this is Mike Masha Cadwallader. Thanks for tuning in to this final July version of Fund Finance Friday Industry Conversations. We thought we'd mix it up a little bit this week, and Wes Miss and I are just going to chat a little bit about the data that we saw from our deal experience in the first half of the year, as well what the two of us are both seeing in the market, both on the deals and in the market generally. Wes, how you doing? Mike, doing great. Doing great. Hope you are. Yeah, doing well, doing well. It's good to see you. I miss you, man. Yeah, same here. Uh, it doesn't look like your, your normal kitchen. Is that the new uh, Masha quarantine office? Yeah, yeah. Maria's been doing a good job of cashing in our Marriott points and finding us places at the beach. So we're at a golf villa in Seabrook Island this week. Nice, nice. The Seabrook wing of Cadwalder. I like it. Great. So let's, ju let's jump into these slides a little bit, Wes. Um, you know, why don't, why don't you uh, lead us through here and start kind of what we saw from a deal count here in the first half? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, as uh, maybe a little bit of a surprise to most folks, but the deal volume has stayed uh, relatively robust and in fact, slightly up from 2019. Um, first quarter, we closed 82 deals and that compares to 57 the year prior. And I think a lot of what was going on there uh, was, you know, March, COVID rolled around and there was a huge push to get things done because of the uncertainty. Um, and so we probably closed, I would say, you know, a third to maybe even half of those 82 deals in March alone. Um, and then that's rolled through into the second quarter. There's been still tons of activity. Yeah. So this is just our U.S. data, right? That's right. Yeah. So, you know, and, and there is a little bit of devil in the details here. I, I suspect a fair number of the uh, first quarter transactions probably were true second quarter transactions that just accelerated in March. Yeah, Mike, that's exactly right. So I think in the last, uh, you know, two, three weeks of March, we closed probably as many deals as we would normally close in a two month period. And so naturally, a lot of those would have been second quarter deals that would have closed in April, maybe some even in May that were accelerated because folks wanted to get it done um, with the pending uncertainty and, and you know, being able to have some, some leverage going forward. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it, it does make me question a little bit, like, does the second quarter decline from 2019 really indicate anything important or was it really just a shift from you know second quarter to first quarter because of the acceleration that's a fair point i think something though that gets lost in the data set is we had a fair number of deals closed right before the july 4th holiday so july mm -hmm. 1st or second closings and so those very well could have been second quarter deals that again just kind of rolled over the finish line there yeah yeah sounds right well let's let's peek at this next slide here it's almost like, you know, 2020 and 2019 were, were pretty darn close, like COVID doesn't exist, not, not a whole lot of change. Yeah, and that seems a little bit surprising given the disruption we saw um, certainly, you know, into, into first quarter, second quarter. But I think when you look at it, okay, March had a ton of deals closed because of the acceleration period. That's why first quarter was up over first quarter 19. Um, and second quarter, I think you would say, well, how would that be up when you had, you know, fewer deals closed, you had that rush in March. But I think when you look at, you know, some of the syndication numbers we were seeing, we had a number of large deals um, closed in second quarter. And so certainly that put on the commitments for, for that quarter. Yeah. And this is another area where, you know, quarters aren't perfect, right? You know, the biggest deal of the year that we closed happened on July 1st. Um, which a day would have influenced the quarterly number pretty meaningfully as well. That's exactly right. And that deal, I think, was over $3 billion, so that would have uh, made second quarter larger than, than what it was in 19. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's, let's slide on to the next, uh, next slide and look at pricing a little bit. What were your thoughts? Yeah, so I think the thing that jumps out at me here is certainly the mean and how much that has moved by about 30 bips. Um, you know, not surprising given the, the environment and the disruption. And that was a key reason why, you know, borrowers wanted to rush to close in March so they could lock in the existing deal they had. Yeah, I, I bet the, the spreads in the second quarter are a little bit understated, too, because a number of the April and May closings were deals that had gone under mandate pre-COVID and the pricing just flowed through. 
and, and the banks didn't want to, you know, retrade the pricing on, on an originally agreed to mandate. Yeah, that's a good point. I think we saw a little bit of, uh, you know, give and take there, you know, some deals, they said, well, look, we can, we can honor the existing terms, so we need to close in a week. And that was part of the rush period as well. Yeah, yeah, that makes good sense. Ten tenors, uh, I, I would have expected tenors to have kind of come in further than this. I was a little bit surprised when I saw how many three-year tenor deals still closed in the second quarter. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. I was a little surprised by these numbers, especially seeing it uh, on the bar chart here. Um, a lot of, you know, what I feel like I've been doing is one-year deals with, you know, uncommitted extension options. So, you know, mm -hmm. folks want to be able to take it out the three or four years, but we don't know what the world's going to look like in a year. And so, you know, leaving that open. Yeah, well, I mean, it may end up being better for the borrowers because in a year from now, if pricing is stabilized, they extend at a lower price. but you know, a little bit hard to predict. So th this was a little bit interesting to me, Wes. You know, you feel like you've got this massive, massive run of NAV deals that happened when COVID started, but th there was a lot more talk than there was actual action. Yeah, again, I think that's been a trend we've seen even pre-COVID, a lot of talk about NAV deals and hybrids and, you know, non-subscription products. Um, I do think, you know, it feels like we've done a lot more NAV deals thus far through this year, but, you know, the numbers don't reflect it as kind of a huge thing. I mean, we're looking at 18 deals um, versus, you know, 142 subscription deals. Yeah, well, maybe if we attract number of NAV deals we talked about uh, that didn't close, maybe, maybe that number would be the one that would be way up. One, one thing that was interesting, uh, Wes, was the number of uh, different banks we talked with and non-bank lenders on NAV facilities. I think we had nine different uh, financial institutions that we did NAV deals with in the first half. That, that number is certainly up from last year. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I mean, you know, kind of at the start of the crisis here, a number of the banks that, you know, were big time players in the space kind of slowed down. Um, and pump the brakes a little bit on being exploratory and taking new opportunities. And it was about serving existing clients and, and their current portfolio. And, um, you know, that created some opportunity for some new players in the space or folks that, you know, previously weren't able to kind of expand into other relationships. And so yeah. we've, we've certainly seen that in our book in terms of, you know, even greater diversity across the clients. Yeah. What, what about this next slide? It looks like the number of bilateral deals we've done has kicked up as a percentage. You have any thoughts around that? Yeah, again, I think it's been, you know, harder to fill out um, commitments uh, like before, especially with some banks taking a pause and then, you know, maybe coming back in, but not being able to commit. Um, you know, there's been a lot more bilateral deals getting done. It's a lot easier to execute on a bilateral transaction in this environment. Um, that said, though, we have seen a lot of chunky syndicated deals. I know, you know, from personal experience, I've closed four uh, deals at over a billion dollars, and there's no way you're doing that deal without filling it out with, you know, eight to 10 banks. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. I mean, one, one thing that Chris Van Heerden did tell me when he was looking at the syndication breakout was the number of lenders that we've seen in syndicates so far this year has narrowed materially from what we saw in 2019. You know, so where in 2019, we were seeing, you know, had touch points with 75 something lenders that that number has really come in. And I do wonder if the, uh, a, a couple of the large banks having slowed has put pressure on the businesses for some of those syndicate lenders that largely, re largely relied on the, the lead banks for origination. Yeah, and we've seen, I think, a lot of the, the lead banks trying to, you know, sell down and limit exposure um, mm -hmm. so they could provide, you know, more products to kind of their core client base during this period as well. Um, yeah. But it's been interesting to see, you know, who's been able to step up and pick up um, those slices of deals. And, you know, to your point, it's, you know, there's there's more players involved, but, you know, it's been a little bit uh, a little bit shaky at times in the syndication market. 
Yeah. Well, one thing I've been super excited about in July, and you, you and I have talked about this before, was you know some of the banks that did slow uh, in March really have come back to life in July. And seeing new deals come in from a lot of those banks has, has been a really positive kind of to my long-term viewpoint. Yeah, certainly. I think the, the LPA reviews are up two or three fold for those banks uh, from what they were, you know, back in back in March and April when this all hit. And uh, that bodes well for the rest of the year. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, jump, jump into the next slide. You know, this this was something that I uh, didn't really register for me uh, anecdotally, but looking at the data, you know, Zach Barnett had mentioned a couple of weeks back that they were having a little bit of trouble finding lenders for SMAs post COVID. And clearly, you know, when you think about how many SMA deals we did in 2019, looking at the first half of this year and only seeing four consummated deals, that, that number feels down materially. Yeah, I mean, definitely the story here is you're absolutely right. I mean, the SMA facility is really the non, um, you know, kind of core commingled um, fund deals are down. And I think it's been a little, the story there is back to basics, you know, trying to limit um, risk and, you know, folks kind of moving away from things that are more concentrated, have a little more hair on it. Um, but that said, I, I think we're going to see a comeback if you look at these numbers for the second half of the year. Um, right now, I know we're doing at least three or four SMAs that are active and will close in the third quarter. And also, we've got uh, a BDC that's active right now as well. So um, that trend may shift. Yeah, yeah. I, I think even the third quarter data is going to, you know, start to really normalize a fair amount in terms of what, what type of transactions we're working on. So the, this final slide I thought was interesting. It's largely consistent with prior years, but just shows the breakdown of the uh, jurisdictions of the funds that we've seen lent to in the first half. I was, I was pleased to see Texas break into the uh, league table for the first time there. <laughs> I noticed that as well. You and I think alike. Um, you know, kind of a couple things on this slide that stood out for me. The, the overall diversity of the jurisdictions, the increase in the volume, um, but then the concentration continues for Cayman Islands and Luxembourg is really kind of the two offshore jurisdictions of choice. Um, and it's been the most interesting deal ever for doing fun deals in the Cayman Islands because of, you know, unless you've been sleeping under a rock somewhere, I mean, the Cayman private funds law has just dominated the market. Um, you know, really in the second and third quarter. And now we're approaching the August 7th uh, SEMA registration deadline. Um, and given recent amendments to the legislation that scope in AIVs, um, it's certainly been a hot topic that's been going on for a while and something that, you know, was a, was a covenant that needed to be complied with in a time frame for deals that were closing earlier in the year. And now that we're a week away from the deadline, really, it's, it's a closing CP. So it's, you know, you've got to be in compliance and have this done to be able to close. Yeah, yeah. So how is that process going in practice? I mean, we're going to close a deal right now. Are, are the funds easily being able to provide the evidence of registration? Yeah, there's been a lot of back and forth. I think a lot of it is just the paperwork and the volume of the registrations that are, that are needed to be done at this point in time. But um, when folks are actually focusing to, to get the registrations in place for closing, it's happening. And it's happening within, you know, a couple of days usually. Um, and we can usually close on a screenshot showing evidence that uh, the funds have been registered in the SEMA system. Good, good. Well, you know, I was certainly hopeful. I visited with Marantz, uh two weeks ago and then with Tina May last week. And they, they both expressed a lot of confidence that these issues were going to work through. So. I am pretty hopeful all the registrations will come in and we'll be in good shape. Absolutely. And, and to the extent the Cayman folks are watching this, an invite to the post-registration uh, party, um, of course, when it is safe to come down. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, what other market observations, uh, you know, moving off the slides now, Wes, what, what, what other market observations have, have you noticed that you think would be really interesting for folks to hear about? Yeah, so I think a couple other trends that are worthy of noting, um, you know, kind of the, the push versus kind of the pull we're seeing now on deals. There was that massive acceleration to get things done in March and, and continued into April. Um, things were normalizing a little bit more in terms of, you know, terms have settled a bit in the market. 
Um, deals are being dictated again by, you know, kind of investment pipeline, fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, so we're seeing delays come up and deals, you know, that, you know, would have closed in two or three weeks back in March now taking kind of the normal, you know, two to three month time frame. Um, that said, I'm still getting daily emails about, hey, you know, we're looking at this deal and they want to close in two weeks. Can you do it kind of thing? So, um, but something that's, that's normalizing a little bit more. And then yeah. the that, that's sort of how it always was, right? It's not like last fall, every deal moved on a perfect six week timeline. I mean, we certainly have the three week hot streaks and then the ones that drag on. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And so um, March and, and April are really kind of a, a, an anomaly in the sense that, you know, I think every single thing we were working on closed. In, yeah. in that two or three week period. And that's never happened, I think, in, you know, as, as long as I've been practicing law. Yeah. And not to mention all of the upsize amendments that we had to consummate during that period and, and a darn good handful of AIV and QB joiners as well. That's exactly right. And that's the second thing I was going to note here um, that, that we're seeing, you know, going on is the, the massive amount of portfolio work and maintenance. So deal count may be slightly down, um, mm -hmm. but really kind of the story is, you know, our work in terms of hours and, and, you know, what we're doing is actually up this year. And that's because of all the increases, joinders, you know, we've processed more qualified borrower joinders this year than I think in the last 10 years combined. And I don't yeah. think that's an exaggeration. We don't, we haven't pulled that data, but I would, I would guarantee you that if we did pull it, I'd be pretty right on that statement. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, one of the things that I'm optimistic is, you know, lo looking forward, you know, in July, we definitely saw some moderation in our overall hours accrual as we did vacation season, and we just simply had fewer lawyers on the desk each week. Um, and also probably some of the clients were on vacation, and that slowed deal progress a little bit. But the forward indicators in July have all come back very, very positive. You know, the number of mandates that we uh, got last week was one of the highest weeks in the history of our practice. And our prospective hours and LPA counts all also massively exceeded our, you know, 12 month rolling average. Um, so, you know, I continue to think for the third quarter, the, the volume looks pretty robust. How, how, how do you feel from, from a deal flow perspective? Yeah, it's really an amazing story when you kind of dig in on the numbers on, on what we're seeing. And, you know, I feel like we see a great cross section of the market to be able to kind of extrapolate out that data and say, this is this is what's going on. And, um, you know, it's a comeback story for a lot of institutions right now. We talked about them kind of pumping the brakes earlier in the year. Well, look, now they're, you know, they've got it on cruise control. They're coming back in the game. We're getting lots of LPAs to review. We're closing deals for these institutions once again. Um, it, it bodes very well for the third and fourth quarter in terms of deal count, commitment levels, you know, rounding out, you know, syndications. And so I think we're going to have a strong finish to the year, you know, absent some type of credit event or something going on in the macro environment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm less bullish on the macro when I look at the virus numbers, especially in the southeast and, and west. But, you know, every every indicator in our business continues to, to show pretty positively. One, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, Wes, was, you know, ILPA came out with a revised LPA last week. And, and the predominant thing they were focused on was the waterfall model trying to move to the European model uh, as opposed to the American model. But I, but I did just want to mention they did not address the subscription facility provisions, um, which in a way is a little bit unfortunate because the subscription facility provisions in their model, to my knowledge, have just been never been commented on by either a bank side law firm or one of the borrower side law firms that does a lot of the fund financing. And, and there are some problems in those provisions that would make it, you know, pretty darn tough for a bank to uh, underwrite. Um, now, you know, I, I'm not too worried about it, right? The model of uh, LPA is just instructive. It's, it's not dispositive, but, but that is kind of an unfortunate carry through from the prior version to the current version. Yeah, and hopefully something we don't start seeing um, a lot of in practice and, you know, to date we haven't. Um, yeah. A lot of the LPAs we've been seeing are, you know, in, in pretty good shape and in a number of cases where LPAs have had flaws, 
um, to the extent it's a newer fund, uh, you know, they've been more willing, the fund has to go back to investors and change that provision given the current environment so they can get, you know, better pricing, better terms from the banks. Yeah, it's more important now than ever when banks are really, really reluctant to take things outside of the four corners of their credit boxes. So something that, you know, it's been, I think, challenging for a lot of folks. You know, we've been five months work from home. Um, I know we've got a lo lot of young people on our team, a lot of folks who have started, you know, their career, who have started, you know, at, at new firms during this period. And I can only imagine how tough that is, you know, to transition jobs during a, a pandemic, working from home and being a young person who needs a lot of mentorship. Um, you know, I know the FFA has been, you know, very strong in investing in, in young people in the industry and FFA University is a huge component of that. Um, wh what's been going on with that, Mike? Yeah, so I'm pleased, you know, we're not able to do FFA University in person in September like we did last year, but we're going to do a virtual version. We're going to reduce the format. It's going to be a one day session, um, but because it's an online format, we're going to be able to really reduce the price pretty significantly. So it's down to $195 a person. Registration is open. It's available on the FFA's website. Uh, and so you can register now. And one of the things I'm working on now is building the, uh, the speakers and the curriculum and materials out. So we're making really good progress. We're going to have, you know, many of the top senior folks in the industry, uh, you know, be presenters. And, and I think we're going to really, really be able to deliver a strong curriculum and program, albeit online this year. That's fantastic. But you, know, you know, Wes, in some ways that's good, right? Because more people can go because, you know, if you had a team in Charlotte or San Francisco last year, it was, you know, just prohibitively expensive to send everybody to New York. And it's not prohibitively expensive to sign them up for, uh, you know, an, an online seminar. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's a really great, uh, you know, I, I hope a lot of folks can participate given that new format. And I'm so happy that you know, it's continuing. Anything I can do to help, just let me know. I mean, investing in the next generation in our uh, industry is something we all need to do. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so switching gears, you know, you, you had a tough year this year in the sense that um, you, you were planning a wedding this year and COVID's been a disruption for you. You know, I know next week is, is your big week. How, how are things going? Yeah, you know, thanks for uh, for asking that. It's kind of, you know, it's always in my mind. Uh, we're, we're eight days away from the big day. Um, you know, we had kind of planned things before this all hit. Things hit, and we were thinking, gosh, you know, we're, we're not going to be able. This isn't going to happen. Um, but fortunately, we're, we were able to go through with it. Um, you know, family only, small wedding at the beach uh, next Thursday. Um, so hoping for good weather, hoping the virus stays away, and uh, you know, things go as planned. So. Well, listen, I, uh, I wish I could be down there to celebrate the, uh, the wedding with you, but I look forward to the party back when uh, the world opens up and you can throw it. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Yeah, good chatting with you this week, Wes. Thanks for joining me. You too, Mike. Enjoy the beach. The material and information contained in the podcast is for general informational purposes only. Any use of the audio within this podcast without the express consent of Cadwallader is prohibited. Quotes from this podcast may not be used without the express permission of the speaker.